We start with that grimy Rick guy. You know, that filthy fella what lives up to his name because he's always so frigging grimy. Squatting in a field and leaving a voice message for Morgan over the walkie about how he finally reunited with his family. And warns him to never ever ever go to Atlanta because it's super hot in the summer and because it's still got a lot of work to do when it comes to social relations with the black community. And I suppose because the city totally belongs to the dead now. Before Ricky Boy totally doxes himself by inviting Mogs to come join them up in the hills. Even though they literally just suffered a nighttime death raid by a bunch of living corpses. <laughs> Meanwhile, back at camp, Andrea just loiters over the corpse of her dead sister like a right creepy weirdo. And once again totally sticks a gat in Rick's face when he comes over to tell her that she's been an insufferable drama queen. And also a right Wally given her dead sister could turn into Iggy Pop at any second. Whoops, I meant to wrinkly haggard bag of bones. LOL! Anyway, after the opening titles, the group discuss shooting Amy's dead body regardless. But Laurie says just let that Andrea bird who's apparently been sitting there all night watching over her stiffy sister totally grieve in peace, bro. Elsewhere, Jim stares into thin air as Daryl and Morales start dragging the bodies of those they lost last night over to the fire pit. But Glenn with two ends has a proper meltdown because he reckons the warm toasty fire is only for walkers and the cold dark six foot holes in the ground are for their people because they were the ones who meant something to them all and thus are the ones who totally deserve to become stinky worm food rather than be disposed of cleanly and efficiently. Shortly after, Jackie notices that Jim is spaced out like he's been eating some funky mushrooms in the forest again and has only gone and got ketchup all over his shirt but she quickly realises he's been bit and that kinky Daryl fella totally jumps at the chance to lift up the bloke's shirt and gulp at his boobies and soon sees that this Jimbo fella has one heck of a hickey. Nice. The group then decide what to do with him and naturally Daryl just wants to stick an axe in his head and be done with it. But Rick says stop talking about wanting to penetrate blokes with your stiff and solid tool because we ain't those kind of fellas son. Said Rick Feller then mentions that he heard through the grapevine that the CDC were working on a cure. So maybe they should try heading up there and stuff. But Shane reckons the army base at Fort Benning is a better bet. Even though it's a hundred miles away and despite us all seeing how fucking cut and useless the military were anyway. When they couldn't even defeat a bunch of slow shuffling corpses with a giant fuck off tank. But Rick adds that the CDC could totally help Jim not shuffle off his mortally coils and sheep. Anyway. Dale then pays his final respects to Amy and waffles on about his own dead wife and how he wasted their last years together being angry and bitter and not letting go in some sort of bizarre effort to somehow make Andrea feel better. But Andrea just says shut up you old coot and proceeds to put Amy's birthday necklace around her cold and slashed up neck. Then we get our very first scene of the series which is Carol and Daryl. As she demands to be the one to smash her abusive husband's face in after the zombos carved him up like a common hog. And even in such a tender moment, you can see the inner steel in Carol as she totally learns what she's capable of. A powerful moment of self-discovery and started a period of such personal growth which ultimately leads to her going full Terminator in season 5, isn't she? And even Daryl's impressed by her courage and sheer brass balls right about now. <laughs> Later, the once dead Amy bird totally starts breathing again and it looks like a Christmas miracle, albeit in the middle of an Atlanta summer. But then she starts trying to munch up her sis and it looks like it's curtains for the number one all night corpse watcher until Andrea says her goodbyes and totally shoots her reanimated sis with an unsilenced gun instead of one of Daryl's quiet arrows and thereby risks totally ringing the dinner bell again. Oh! Elsewhere, Rick and Shane are digging even more graves and the tension is now thicker than Piers Morgan's waistline. So Rick tells him to just spit it out already and Shane says that sodding off and taking half our manpower on some half cocked rescue mission and all to save a super southern sexist toxic racist dude who he had no idea was even still alive and just to bring back a few shooters is totally what led to loads of their campmates doing that dying thing and she. Naturally Rick says that ain't really fair bro as what good is more people without arms? Which is a great question to be fair. And exactly what the makers of Flamidamide should have asked themselves before just shrugging and sticking it on the market back in the day. Not a great plan. Anyway, 
Daryl soon arrives and is totally annoyed that they ain't burning the infectious, virulent, disease-infested bodies like any sane people would. And burying the fuckers for some gay emotional reason just puts them all at risk. And also, it's like so much work, bro. Then he moans that no one even knows who's in charge anymore, what any of the rules are. And the corrupt deputy sheriff who loves to shoot kids in the forehead and steal dead girls' bikes totally says that there ain't no rules. And Laurie then says we need to mourn and bury our dead if we're ever going to feel like civilised people again. So you better get your rednecky butt used to it and shut up about it already. Meanwhile, in the RV, Jimbo is having cold sweats and dreaming about the Rolling Stones. Whoops, I meant scabby half-dead fellas. They then bury Amy as Laurie tells her husband that the whole CDC plan is a bit fucking mad and possibly a little reckless planning to go all the way over there on a simple hunch. Later, Rick and a frustrated Shane have a Barney in the woods after Rick says his mate would feel differently if it was his family needed to protect. And Shane just can't believe this grimy fella would say that to him after he spent the last two months looking after his wife in Sprog. And he made sure to look after that Laurie bird real good and proper. And twice on a Tuesday. Suddenly, though, they hear something in the woods. And after splitting up like a ripe pair of donuts, Shane goes full nut job like he's having flashbacks to Nam and totally thinks about shooting Rick through the trees so that he can go back to playing happy families, teaching Carl to fish for frogs and porking his best mate's wife in a mushroom field. But luckily, he eventually comes to his senses before hilariously realising that Dale was standing there and watching him think about murdering his grimy chum the whole time. Low oaks. The next morning, and a group have decided to totally go do that CDC trip. So Rick gets back on the walkie to leave another voice note for Morgan, telling him that they're all sodding off to the CDC, and he's left instructions on a random car to follow him. But before they set off to leave, Morales and his family decide they ain't participating in this madness, and are totally not going on this random trip to some place they don't even know is still up and running. So Rick gives him a revolver and half a box of ammo, whilst Daryl just winces at the sharing of resources, what he totally considers worth more than gold these days. So the convoys part ways, and we say goodbye to that Morales fellow who's barely done anything noteworthy in the whole freaking show. Well, at least till he pops up again in season 8, when Daryl finally gets to end his season's long grudge about Morales taking a share of their weapons. But I suppose it don't really matter. Not one little bit. Anyway, the RV soon breaks down. So Rick pays a visit to a rapidly deteriorating Jim, who says that he can't take any more travelling and he's got a one-way ticket to Portland, Oregon. Whoops, I mean hell. As he withers away and chokes on his own lungs. But he's totally okay with doing that dying thing and pretty much wants to die so he can meet back up with his deaded family. So they should just leave him to it already. So they totally do and then recklessly dump him under a random tree to die without even tying him up so he doesn't inevitably become a walker and then munch up some innocent passers-by later down the line. Okay. So they all say their goodbyes, as that Jackie Bird hilariously kisses a man with an infectious fever because reasons. Then we cut to a random bloke doing a video diary like a right emo teen, talking about some incident what he's codenamed Wildfire, and says it's been 194 days since the outbreak and 63 days since the disease went global. Turns out his name is Dr. Jenner, and he's out here doing some bake experiments to try and find a cure in she. But because he hasn't been sleeping due to living underground, and also because he's a Wally who likes to get drunk whilst doing science, he knocks over some acid and totally destroys his super precious and rare TS-19 samples, thereby ruining his crucial experiments to save the world and giving his finger a little acidy ouchie. So naturally... He's now going to get even more blindingly drunk and then blow his own brains out in the morning. Meanwhile, the gang arrive at the CDC and find a bunch of dead bodies all over the lawn, as well as more military tanks what somehow couldn't be figuratively and sometimes even literally unarmed walking corpses. But before Dr. Jenner can put a shooter to his knocking though, the motion sensors go off as the group arrive at the front door to see it all shuttered up and more fortified than an American election. And as walkers start to arrive and trap them in a literal dead end, the group descend into a panicked chaos as Shane suggests cucking out and trying for Fort Benning, even though they know it's miles away and their cars will never make it. And Laurie just screams about not wanting to be out in the city after dark. 
Normally stoic Rick then also devolves into hysterical desperation before he notices the camera move as Dr. Jenner just prays for them to sod off because he just wants to yeet himself in peace and they're all cramping his style and she. So Shane tries to drag Rick away as night falls and more walkers approach and he screams to whoever's behind the camera that they're totally killing them by leaving the shutters down and letting them become zombie chow which is especially harsh since they have kids in tow and also a small Asian so that's technically a hate crime bro. Fearful of baseless accusations of racialism and totally getting cancelled for letting a small Asian and also a pair of black people die needlessly, Jenna soon comes to his senses as suddenly the shutters indeed open and a blinded white light appears. Kind of like a miraculous act of mercy direct from heaven. Well, either that or some silly sods left the lobby light on all this time. And that's it. That's episode 5. But man, Rick still hasn't told his family about that Wayne fella like he promised. You know, the bloke whose guts he smeared over everyone after he carved him up like a common hog in episode 2. And I don't really know what he's waiting for, to be honest. But there's only one episode left in the season to make good on his random promise. So let's go see if he does it. Now onward to the finale. We start in a chaotic hospital corridor. As Shane struggles to find a doctor or even a nurse to come help his poorly buddy. And before you can say, oh, I guess they really are now modelling America's healthcare system on the British NHS, he sees some military fellas gun down some sickly people in the halls, who hilariously get a bout of instant karma when the walkers burst in and munch them all up good and proper. Turns out this is a flashback, and we see how Shane really did try to save his comatose comrade what loves to laze around all day after being put in a deep sleep for an armpit wound because reasons. But he doesn't know if disconnecting the monitors would kill him before a power cut does it for him. And he totally thinks that Sheriff Ricardo's dead after rubbing his face and his nipples, also because reasons. So, thinking he's croaked because Rick didn't wake up and say why you motorboating your co-worker in his sleep, Shane decides to barricade the door and get the heck out of Dodge already. And after the opening title sequence, we pick up with that blinding white light from the end of the last epi, as they soon enter the main lobby of the CDC. Suddenly though, a random ginger still dressed in his pyjamas appears holding a shooter and promptly asks if any of them are infected. But the fucker doesn't say with what. But anyway, he says that they can stay only if they submit to a blood test to prove they ain't about to turn into cannibalistic monsters and shit. And if they have anything to bring in, then they should do it now. Because once that outer door closes, it totally stays closed, bro. So, after the most awkward elevator ride since that dodgy Wonka fella sent a small boy in a coughing dodger flying through the roof of his chocolate factory for shits and giggles, Dr. Jenner takes them all into his underground lab base and tells them that they totally have the gaff to themselves, because tragically, there's no one else left but him. Aww. Later, they all have a slap up meal and proceed to get more merry on the juice than Chandler or friends try to forget about the current state of his career. Bruh as Rick raises a gleeful toast and totally thanks their random host for taking them in and totally saving their lives and shit. But then Shane goes full Buzz Killington and asks what the fuck happened here and why did everyone run off like a bunch of cucks and stuff. And Jenna flat out states that most of the staff actually just killed themselves out of fear and hopelessness. And naturally, everyone's face falls in the most jarring tonal shift since Superman snapped Zod's neck and was then all smiles about it five minutes later at the end of Zack Snyder's Man of Steel film. Fuck you! But anyway, this doctor bloke totally stayed and kept working, hoping to do some good. And because he was too much of a wet wipe to quote, opt out. Jenna then shows a group where they can sleep and also tells them that the energy is scarce so they better use it sparingly. So, after being explicitly told to go easy on the hot water, Shane soon gets sozzled in the shower, whilst Andrea just sits on the floor and barely even in the water stream. Ah, no! After cleaning himself up good and proper, Dale then goes and sits by a toilet to nurse a vomiting Andrea, who proceeds to whine and whinge about losing everything she ever loved and how the world is totally over and she. But Dale reckons it's simply an opportunity to make a new start. And she just stares at him like his head is buried so deep in denial that he can taste Egyptian fish. Then a blottoed Rick goes to thank Dr. Jenner, who's sitting at his workstation all alone like a right Billy No Mates. And Ricky Boy says he doesn't know what it's like to try and survive in the world now, 
But it's well tough out there having to live in a cosy tent and having some baldy stranger washer kecks in a creek. And Jenna's just like, yeah man, sounds tough bro. Naturally, Rick says it's only a matter of time till those dead fellas munch them all up like chicken McNuggets. And he's totally sick of having to put on a brave face to keep hope alive for his family and the wider group. But Jenna just develops a creepy smile and says, it'll all be okay. In the most unnerving platitude since my parachute instructor forgot to pack the chute. And my girlfriend said she never liked my bottom two vertebrae anyway. Anyway. Meanwhile, over in the rec room, a casino boat Shane spies hot totty Laurie reading a book in her socks. So naturally, as a flight of the Concord superfan, he thinks it's totally business time. You know when I'm down to just my socks what time it is. It's business time. No, when I'm down to my socks, it's time for business. That's why they call business socks. Ooh. Anyway, turns out Laurie don't want to do that sex thing no more. Especially with a guy who lied to her and said her husband had gone to the little sheriff's station in the sky. But he says he totally tried his best to save her sluggish hubby, but the machines had lots of wires and were making buzzy noises, so he thought he'd better not touch him. And he even stuck his face between his jubblies to make sure he was dead, so shut up about it already. And besides, if he hadn't told her that Rick was a goner, she and Carl never would have come with him to safety. So really, he totally saved both their lives and she... And naturally, he thinks he deserves payment by getting a bit of late night pussy. So she claws his neck when he tries to do a Ron Jeremy and totally force himself on her. And she just tells him to sod off and get back to punishing bad people in the MCU already. The next morning, everyone is hung over at breakfast. And Dale can't even let Dr. Jenna have his morning Weetabix before asking him to spill the beans about why the dead are randomly rising and doing all these bad things. So he takes them into his giant underground lab to deliver a giant expo dump. And shows them how some dope called TS-19 volunteered to be studied after she got bit and turned into Iggy Pop. Whoops, I meant a skeletal nightmare. Apparently, the virus invades the brain like meningitis, making the adrenal glands hemorrhage as the major organs, including the brain, totally shut down and she... Then he says resurrection times vary. Sometimes it can be three minutes and sometimes eight hours. Though the longest they heard of was some geezer from Nazareth who took three fucking days to come back to life. LOL! Anyway, the virus just restarts the brainstem to get them up and moving, before they merely go on to act on mindless instinct, i.e. they become Joe Biden types. Anyway, Andrea scoffs when she realises he has no clue what the heck this thing is. Despite him having a whole lab to himself to do his one fucking job and save the world and she. But given comms went down a month ago, he has no idea if any other labs out there are doing any better than him. Though if they ain't getting drunk and knocking over test tubes full of acid all over their only specimens, then I'm sure they're well ahead of this fleet. And they soon realise that it's all gone global and the world is more fucked than an incel sweaty palm. Dale then notices a clock counting down in giant red numbers, wonders if it could be a good thing. But Jenna just says, well, it is if you ever wanted to learn the skill of fire breathing. Because when it hits zero, the air will be set on fire and the gaff's going to go up like the 4th of July on crack, son. What? Because down in the level below, they realise they're running on emergency power. And fail safes are in place to ensure nothing super bad like weaponized smallpox can ever be released on the public in the event of an energy failure. Though, why anyone would even care now that zombie virus has already decimated the world? I don't know. Elsewhere, Dr. Jenner then holds a pick of his wife and says he did the best he could in the time he had. Though, I would have to question such a statement, given all he did was start day drinking before knocking over some acid into his super rare precious samples and thereby fucking the human race forever. Anyway. Turns out the building is closing itself and locking the place down harder than a Democrat governor. Whilst all power is soon diverted to keeping the computers online. As they approach the half hour mark on the countdown timer. Jenna then randomly tells Andrea that the French were the last ones to hold out of their labs as far as he knows. And even said that they were close to finding a solution to the outbreak. But given how they're all now having to deal with a fuck ton of cultural enrichment going on over there. They might have a bit too much on their plate to keep looking into zombies and stuff. Anyway, the group soon starts to panic as Dr. Jenna locks them in the lab. Naturally, Rick demands that he open it, 
But Jenna just says, nah, it's totally pointless, bro. Because the top side doors and emergency exits are locked too and totally controlled by computers. So you're all up shit's creek, son. And besides, he totally warned them all at the start that, quote, once the outer door closes, it stays closed. And you all heard me say that. So now you made your bed and you've got a lie in it, mate. And Jenna just says it's better this way anyway. Because at least in here, you'll get a quick and painless death. Whilst outside waits a short and brutal life full of pain and misery. But Rick says, chill bro, because we have no intention of going to Chicago. So have a word with yourself and totally open the doors already. But they can't even smash their way out. So naturally, hot-headed Daryl tries to threaten the life of the man who is literally already sitting and waiting for death. Until Jenna totally drops Rick in it by telling the group what he told him in strict confidence last night whilst totally off his face. And reminds him that he said himself that it was just a matter of time before everyone he knows and loves gets deaded. And despite such a simple statement basically applying to general life even before the zombie apocalypse, no one can really believe that the corrupt deputy sheriff who loves shooting kids and nicking dead girls' bikes would be so disingenuous to their faces just to give them a false sense of hope and she. Carol then begs the doctor to see sense, because she reckons her daughter Sophia doesn't deserve to die like this. And given the course of events in season 2, I'm thinking she's going to come to regret that line of thinking and rejecting the offer for a quick and painless death in a giant conflagration. And Jenna reiterates the point by asking, wouldn't it be kinder to just hold your loved ones and wait for the timer to run out? So naturally, Shane grabs a shotty and says, how's this for fucking kindness? And straight up does a Daryl and threatens to blow the head off the suicidal geezer whose head is about to be blown off in 10 minutes anyway. And Rick has to smack his mate out of yet another bout of mindless violence, and leaving me wondering how on earth such an ill-tempered aggressive bloke ever got accepted into local law enforcement. Gah! No wonder that BLM lot want to defund coppers with all these corrupt nutters running around shaggy wives and stealing innocent civilians' bikes and stuff. Anyway, Rick asks why Jenna even stayed if he was so utterly hopeless, and he says he made a promise to his wife, who turns out to be that dopey TS-19 patient, and she asked him to stay and work as long as he could. And the doc says she was the one who used to run this place and was one of the brightest minds of her generation, whilst he was just a glorified desk jockey. And so it's pretty ironic that he became the last man standing at the end of an apocalypse when he's not even smart enough to fix the world or even pay attention around test tubes full of acid. Oh! Laurie then says, please do for us what your wife asked of you and let us keep trying for as long as we can. So having cunningly used his own words against him, he totally cucks and lets them out of the lab. Although it's still rather pointless given the top side is locked down and there's nothing he can really do about it. So they all rush to get the heck out of Dodge. Whilst Rick stops to tell Dr. Jenna that he's totally grateful. But he ominously says that the day will come when you won't be. And before you could say, I'm thinking that day will be in season 3 episode 4 and also the season 7 premiere. The doc shakes his hand and then whispers something in his ear. But frustratingly, we don't get to hear what it is. Liberties! But Jackie and Andrea say they're totally staying. And whilst everyone just shrugs when it comes to Jackie, Dale totally throws a hissy fit about that Andrea bird who he's come to see as a surrogate daughter. But he can't convince her to go. So he sits down like a right sulky teenager and says, fine then, I'm totally dying too, bitch. Whilst upstairs, the gang finally get to the outer doors but can't break through the windows. And not even with chairs or a shotgun. Well, that is until Carol conveniently remembers that she's been carrying a fucking life grenade around in her handbag ever since Rick brought it back from Atlanta and she washed his kex back in episode 3. Nice. Meanwhile, back downstairs, Andrew is guilt-tripped into reconsidering that whole perishing in a giant fireball thing because Dale is totally determined to die with her and she... And naturally, she says that ain't fair because she don't really want that on her conscience, bro. But he just says tough titty. Because she don't get to come into his life and make him care about people and then just arbitrarily check out. So he's totally staying and that's that. And back above, the group race over to the cars and are about to drive off before they spot Andrew and Dale finally getting out. But they don't have time to get to the cars, so they all take cover in the RV and behind a small wall. As Jack and Jen prepare to get blown to Kingdom Come together. And moments later, the entire facility goes up in a huge ball of flames. And hilariously, with a better CG explosion than the one in the actual series finale 12 years later. What? Somehow though, 
all the characters are A-OK. -okay. And don't even have their eardrums burst or eyebrows singed off, despite being right in front of the fucking thing. And we end on a musical montage. As the characters try to process the literal and figurative shock, and totally wonder what the thrift to do now. Whilst Andrew just gives Dale evils about making her live, and missing her one ticket to reunite with her dead sister and leave this well painlessly. Because now she's going to have to get ripped apart by zombies, or suffer some other awful inevitable fate at some point in the future. And he just looks guilty as fuck, given they were both being pretty damn selfish back in that lab, to be fair. And that's it. That's season one. But wow, what an opening. Though I was a bit confused about some things. Like why does Jenna care if they're infected, if the place is about to blow up the next day? And speaking of that scene, I guess it's just lucky that no one put their hand up when he ambiguously asked if they were infected, because the geezer could have blown them away over a cold sore or chlamydia or some shit. And what did he whisper in Rick's ear, I wonder? Was it who the next James Bond's going to be? Or maybe the secret ingredient to Colonel Sanders 11 herbs and spices, perchance? <laughs> hmm. Whatever. I'm still pretty pissed that that grimy Rick filler didn't ever tell his family about Wayne and his backstory, when he totally promised he would do so back in episode 2 after he used the poor man's guts as biological camouflage. Gah! What a dishonest liar! And did he ever return that dead girl's bike? <coughs> right, that's it. I'm going to have to write a rather strongly worded letter of complaint against the rural Georgia Sheriff's Department and totally get them defunded. Because it seems to be full of liars, rapists and literal child killers. <coughs> but anyway, that's the plot and that's a lot. Considering that bell thing so you don't miss any future recaps. Tell me if you like this series in the comments if you have time. And I'll see you in the next one.